All right, welcome to our Clubhouse conversation on community and economic development with uh, Dan Taylor and Bob Minas. Um, this is our second podcast. So at some point in time, Bob, I was thinking we should ask people about the term economic development versus ECDEV, but we'll worry about that later. That's uh, an interesting debate you and I are having, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob, to tick off, kick off the meeting. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, we are recording this and we're going to turn it into a podcast. And I will do my best to share the podcast with everybody on the call today. Thank you, Dan. And, and thank you, everybody in the audience and both on stage for making the time during the lunch hour to join us. Dan and I started this club about four or five weeks ago, and we really wanted to start a conversation globally with economic development professionals, both in, in a municipal or regional environment, but also in a community environment. You know, what are the things that we could learn from each other, uh, best practices or things that we've experienced? And today, we really wanted to bring up the topic of tourism. And when we bring up the topic, it's very general. Our hope between Dan and I is really to facilitate the conversations between all of you to ask the questions of what you'd love to know, perhaps provide some insights on what's worked or, or any sort of commentary as well. The folks that you see on stage are folks that have joined us in the past, so they're generally uh, really brilliant speakers on the topic of economic development. So if you haven't yet, make sure that you do uh, check out their profile, follow them, connect with them because I'm sure they're in other rooms sharing some other amazing knowledge as well. For those of you that are new to Clubhouse in general, we'd love to hear from you with any questions. So to use the question feature on the very bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon with a hand on top of what looks like a notepad. If you press that, that shows that you're raising your hand and either Dan or I can add you to the stage to share in your not to share your question as well and benefit from that going forward. Um, that's all I have. And as Dan had mentioned, we are recording this session. So feel free to um, share as much as you want to share based on that. And with that, Dan, I think I'd like to open the topic on tourism and really un uh, ask the question. Uh, and maybe, Carrie, I'll, I'll, I'll talk with you because you've had both economic development experience and cultural experience. You know, when we look at everything that's happened in our world over the last year, I, I believe it's, I believe this is the one year anniversary today of when we went into lockdown in Ontario. I'm curious to know, Carrie, what do you see moving forward for tourism? Do you feel like we're simply going to recover to where we were? Or do you see some augmentation and innovation happening in the arena? Sorry, are you talking to Carrie King? I just want to make sure oh, it's me because yeah, we've sorry. also got Brandon on the call and he's our specialist. I'm sorry. Carry with an eye is what I meant to say. Sorry. So that's me, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was really lucky um, to have spent a decade of my career as um, an economic developer and working uh, for Durham Tourism. And now uh, tourism is run by Kristen and Brandon, uh, Brandon, who's on the call. But I think, you know, so much has changed, particularly around events and event um, production was a huge piece of what brought tourism in into Durham region. Uh, I think, you know, sport tourism being uh, one of the largest um, parts of the sector. And I know Don Terry, who's been, he's on the call as well, which um, he's done a lot of work um, helping to attract sport tourism to Durham region. Um, so I think that's, you know, one of the biggest challenges um, we, we had um, the Ontario Lacrosse Festival, which brings in, you know, huge dollars and huge numbers. Um, so it's it's trying to look at how we can um, how we can move forward with tourism, um, you know, amidst the pandemic that we have. I know for me now running uh, a public art gallery, station gallery, um, it's it's challenging because for us as well, um, our our tourism component being around culture has been producing um, special events, um, summer and like summer concert series or other events that involve bringing a lot of people together and, and fundraising in that way. And now that's just not possible. It's been a big part of our, our revenue generation piece. So um, I would love to be able to work with this brilliant group of people that you put together and congratulations on that to try to address um, event um, event-based tourism and cultural tourism um, as a discussion point. Really great thoughts. Thank you, Carrie, with an eye. Carrie King, 
Hendon, do you mind if I include you in the conversation with your experience and, and the time that you've had in tourism? Uh, do you have any comments to add what you're seeing as well? Brandon might be looking for his mute button. There we go. Hello. Hello. That's okay. Hey, everyone. I am, uh, I'm actually en route. I'm just pulling into regional headquarters, passing by the town of Whitby um, for one of my, I guess, few trips into the office. Um, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting topic. And Carrie brings up a lot of good points where we, as a, as a region, we've really heavily relied on sport tourism um, and event-based activities to kind of drive overnight occupancy within our accommodation providers. And, and I think we're getting to that point where we're seeing sport is really coming back. I'm pulling into a parking structure. So if you lose me, I our tourism van in for an oil change, even though it's sat in a parking garage for three months. But um, we're seeing these events start to come back, working with event organizers across different levels, um, working with the Oshawa Generals on a Memorial Cup. Or there's, there's a lot of things that are happening and events that want to come back. And this morning, the provincial government announced more funding for the Reconnect festivals uh, and event funding to help get Ontario back on track. And so I, I think there's no shortage of event organizers that want to run, but it's getting the lead time uh, to be able to organize, get funding in place, get staffing in place, ensure you're following all these safety protocols um, and getting ready to kind of open back up. So I think we're starting to see events come back online. And I think what you're going to see, and one of the things that I'll, I'll really commend Don Terry and, and Lori Talling on our team on the sports side is sport tourism for Durham region has not always been about, you know, just bringing in big tournaments, heads and beds, uh, lather, rinse, repeat. It's really been about driving home the value or the experience that we can have and making sure that if you're coming in for the Ontario Lacrosse Festival over 10 days, that you're not just coming in for a tournament, you're coming in for an experience. And so we like to work on these value add programs that, um, you know, really reflect well on us as a destination. And we leave that kind of mem really leaving positive memories with the athletes. And, and I'll kind of give our had a tip um, on winning a national award uh, for the 2019 Durham region, Ontario Parasport games that won the Canadian sport event of the, of the year with a budget under 1 million. So I think that's where, we need to go as destinations and event organizers is what experience are you going to offer me to make it worth my time to kind of come back outside after COVID? Really great thoughts there. Thank you, Brandon. I, I'm curious to know, and, and I'm going to throw this one to Dan as well. Um, when you're considering all of these options or these abilities to, to reinvigorate tourism, if you will, in these communities, do you find uh, Dan and Brandon, especially, that there's a distinction between your urban centers and your rural centers and how this is being built out? Do you find that it's a bit more of a struggle for rural? Dan, what do you think? Well, Bob, you know, I have, I have a bit of a question too. So oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So without fully understanding, you know, different communities, resources, usually resources are, are less in rural areas. Although I wonder uh, if rural offers more open spaces for events. So I put this out to the floor. I've, I've had quite a bit of experience putting on some, some great events. One that's sort of happening right now uh, called Maple in the County, uh, which is a maple syrup festival on a, on a revised unofficial basis because of COVID and, and, and several other events. But they're all events where people are gathering um, sometimes shoulder to shoulder, sometimes not. Like maple, you could imagine you can spread that out more. Uh, I uh, put this out to the group is, you know, in the transition period and then post, um, post vaccination period, uh, how are people imagining like events with safety protocols and, you know, with probably some form of restriction on, on people or proximity? I'm, I'm really curious to hear what the thoughts are out there. I think I think the first person I'd love to draw in is Carrie King. Given that you have a gallery, Carrie, are you, uh, are you considering this? A concern to you, Dan's question. Yes. Well, yeah. It's been it's been something I've been waiting on, and I was kind of lucky to Maria, who's kind of a little more tapped in um, to um, the town. But for me, what we're doing is building our plans right now, virtually, um, with the hope that if we go into Orange, that producing events on our patio this summer where we can perhaps have
well. Um, but we're down, we're down several hundred thousand dollars in revenue. And a big chunk of it is the fact that we can't produce events. I mean, we also can't produce our our art programming in our studios because we can't have classes. So we're doing virtual and um, the revenue is just not there. So we're looking at revenue generation in a different way. Instead of trying to get bums and seats per se, we're looking at sponsoring our classes virtually and we're offering them for school to school boards and whatnot. But to get back to the question of um, events. I mean, I've been producing events my entire life where, you know, we bring 5,000 people down to a park in, in Durham. That's just not happening. I don't see Canada Day happening that way. And I'm sure Maria could probably bring more um, in her role as director with the town. Hi there, just jumping in. Um, yeah, we are reviewing literally our events planning on uh, like, you know, every every few months um, in terms of when we're in the position to open permitting up again, as an example. Um, we are not hosting any third party events or community events right now at this time because of the gathering restrictions. Um, and we will likely be holding off up until Canada Day at this point, um, similar to other municipalities. Um, if the zones change <clears throat> for the Durham region that allow us to have some gatherings, we might be looking at things where we're literally, you know, it's like a ticket, ticket issue based um, event where we have to only um, take in a certain number uh, of people. We're definitely opening up to drive through and drive in um, type of events. Um, looking at those, some of the, our third party organizers have been um, exploring that as an option for them. And those that's last year as well with um, a number of um, activities in the communities where third party um, conducted um, the drive through events. I, I participated in a couple myself and it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, um, it, it's really, really tough really tough to try and organize um, events and for Whippy being the community that it is it, um, our community events are really a big draw for us as well especially those that we host through um, the municipality itself and some of our uh, large nonprofits. Um, and we're just not having those um, attractions at this point in time so that that certainly is I think a lot of obviously a lot of communities are feeling that as well. And so Lara, I'd like to include you in the conversation and talk about community. So, you know, are we looking at communities being impacted by the, the lack of physicality? Are we looking at a future of virtual live hybrid? What's your thoughts, Laura, when you look at communities in terms of building or even advocating? Well, you know, I think that there's been two things that have happened. Um, one, I think that there has been incredible innovation that has occurred as a result of us not being able to do in-person events. Things like drive-in concerts or a Zoom concert series. Fascinating. Um, and that innovation has really carried forward to not only the way that we are producing events, but also in the way that government is looking at the cultural um, economy. And you know, for example, in Utah, they put together a $3 million fund to help support organizations that produce that, not that those to support their cultural and um, artist communities. Thank you, Laura. That's, that's, that's some interesting insight as well. I think we have, uh, for lack of a better word, into it. Brandon, did you want to add to the as well? Yeah, I'll jump in. I'll just update everyone that I'm boosting our tourism ban now because it's sat for so long. So all <laughs> other duties as assigned in economic development. Um, but it's an interesting point on the urban and rural mix. And as a region, we've actually just hired, uh, we moved, Kristen, who's on our team, 
uh, she just started a new role at basically the start of COVID around this time last year um, in a new tourism role that focuses only on our northern, uh, our three northern municipalities being Uxbridge, Scugog, um, which you may be more familiar with Port Perry and Brock Township, which covers Beaverton, Sunderland and Cannington. Um, to help support, there's a lot of interest to grow tourism, whether it be through wayfinding signage, new business attractions, there's a lot of farm to table agriculture um, operators within the region. And so the region's taken the stand that we want to be there to support these municipalities with some hands and, hands and boots on the ground to get those things done. Um, and then similarly, being able to work with our urban municipalities like the, the town of Whitby and their culture plan and, and elevating. Um, we were on a great call with the city of Oshawa this morning about a Troubadour series, um, which launched last year in the city of Oshawa with um, outdoor music taking place at a number of venues downtown. We're looking to grow that program right across the region. And, and so it kind of um, gets us back into that hosting, that cultural music, downtown revitalization, and, and all of those pieces from a, a quality of life and, and great places to live come in where um, you position the messaging now for residents to one, discover their their downtown or a new downtown in, in their neighborhood. Um, we're experiencing tremendous population growth in Durham region right now. And then we'll be ready to welcome people back. And we know a large contingent of visitation this summer is going to be visiting friends and relatives. So really ramping up to, to prepare for that. That's amazing. I'm Dan and, and the people who know me here know I'm a huge advocate for rural communities and entrepreneurship. So I love hearing that. So let me let me throw something else out on the floor along what Brandon was was just sharing. And Will, thank you for joining us on stage. Uh, so feel free to, to contribute if you'd like. Um, I'd love to sort of ask this question around, um, especially in 2020, we've really looked at this model of staycation. How are we creating more local tourism as opposed to inviting people from outside communities in? Do you think that there, with, with the prevalence of people moving into communities from urban centers into more rural areas, do you think this is this is a potential business model about looking at how do we facilitate much more local tourism or local activation of tourism, I should say, over trying to invite other community members into our community? Would anyone on the floor like to jump in on that? Well, sure, yeah. it's, Car it's Carrie here. Um, if that's okay, I can jump in. Um, in the case of Durham region, I think, and Brandon might know the numbers better than, than me, um, we've been from primarily a VFR market, so a visiting friends and relatives market, for a long time, probably over 70% of our visitors are VFR. So as um, our communities grow and so many people are moving in uh, from the Toronto area, I think the opportunity is even greater to build on that, especially with the diverse community that we're attracting from, you know, people from all over the world. So I think when we're designing our tourism or cultural offerings, we there's more of a focus now on looking at different, um, you know, showcasing different cultures. So for us at Station Gallery, we're producing more and more exhibitions that tie in you know other elements whether it be dance from south asia or you know musical components to tie into certain um certain events that we that we do whether they're going to be virtual or or in person so i think the opportunity around the vfr market is um you know i, th I think it's pretty standard across ontario but particularly in durham that's you know it it tends to be the the offering that we have Thank, thanks, Carrie. Yeah, if I could jump in to compliment Please. Carrie here, it's Maria. Sorry if if I don't if you don't mind. Um, I know that Carrie's working really closely with our tourism lead over at the town of Whitby. Um, everything that we did in the culture plan and now moving into uh, developing our tourism strategy and working with our partners is all about actually we're really going to leverage the whole staycation concept quite significantly. Um, because we realize um, you know the limitations are still going to be around for a while. Um, restrictions may lift a little bit, but people are really, you know, we're, we are all itching to experience um, life and culture and community again. Um, and all of those pieces have an economic development component as well. So um, that's a big piece of some of the things that we're, Whippy will be working on and leveraging our, our local strengths and assets, our culinary, our microbreweries, our art community. Um, we have a lot going on here that our culture plan was really able to dig out and we're going to be leveraging those pieces from for that staycation purpose. 
Thanks, uh, Maria and Carrie. I want to uh, point out a couple things. One, I'm not sure if it's an Ontario or a Canadian definition, but tourism is defined as people coming from uh, just outside a 40 kilometer radius. So this whole idea of staycation uh, fits in perfectly, you know, with um, with that definition and also local people. The other thing, unless you're like a major center, say like a, you know, a Toronto or a Montreal or what have you, um, which are in, in good times easier to attract, uh, you know, from away, smaller areas and lesser known areas, uh, that's really where the gravy is, right? Is with your, your local population, your regional population. And, you know, good news, bad news. I think the good news is with COVID is people have disposable income and our, our speakers have indicated that they are itching to get out and do things. So I think if we're able to provide those experiences and the safety, I suspect there's an almost, you know, insatiable appetite over the next 6, 12, 18 months to get it and experience whatever people can package. So I just put that out there for the group. Wonderful, Dan. And Don, thank you for joining us on stage. I'm sure you have something to contribute. I just wanted to take a second really quick and reset the room. I know that we've had some new folks joining us and then I'm going to throw it over to Don. Welcome for those of you that have just joined us. We are talking today about tourism as it relates to economic development and more specifically, what does tourism look like in 2021 and, and going forward? Just a heads up, uh, we are actually recording this room for a podcast. So just so you know, if you're going to contribute, it will be there. And if you're in the audience and have a question, and this is your first time here on Clubhouse, there is an icon on the bottom that looks like a hand with a, a notepad. Pressing that essentially raises your hand and we'd love to invite you on stage to sort of hear what thoughts or shares that you might have as well. And then of course, if you're really getting a lot of value in this room, please look at that plus symbol and invite any of your associates that you might know that would learn, that would love to learn any of the things that we're sharing here, or maybe even contribute to it as well. And then of course, finally, our speakers on stage are all amazing, brilliant people in economic development. If you haven't already, be sure that you're following them and connecting with them because I'm sure they're all around Clubhouse uh, disseminating knowledge uh, in an amazing way. So with that, Don, can I throw it to you to add to the conversation here? Well, thank you very much, Bob, and my apologies for, for joining late. I had a previous engagement, but um, I love this group and, and happy to be part of it. One of the things that we're doing in the town of Ajax is really ramping up identification of the tourism assets that we do have and then creating an awareness amongst our own residents of all of the assets that we have here because we really feel that there's a underappreciation amongst our own citizenry um, in the town of Ajax in the region about all that we do have to offer and then we'll be undertaking promoting those opportunities for hyper local tourism. Wonderful that's that's definitely good to hear and I think we have a lot of contributors here from from Durham so it sounds like Durham is really active in in facilitating what that tourism looks like moving forward. Did anyone else want to add to the conversation as well? Or do we have any questions? Oh, Will, thank I you. Could just, yeah, yeah, I could just jump in there, Bob. Thanks uh, so much for inviting me on and uh, great to have this conversation today. I think, uh, so I look after the tourism department here in the city of Merritt, uh, three hours north of Vancouver. We have a population of about 7,000 people. And on average, we're right along the highway and we see about uh, 10,000 people on uh, the Coquihalla Highway uh, on average per day. So we rely quite a bit on uh, tourists that are coming through. But uh, something that I wanted to share with the group is we're taking this time right now as a rural community uh, to focus on the infrastructure for our uh, tourism businesses, but also on the planning stage. So uh, we launched a mobile kiosk to make sure that our tourism activities aren't just focused on the bricks and mortar buildings that we have. And right now we're leaning quite heavy into attracting those tourism businesses, uh, completing a tourism asset inventory to show exactly what we have and focusing on a sector profile, focusing on tourism, because we have seen quite a few of our local tourism businesses around the uh, equipment rental, bike, bike rental, uh, um, you know, in summer, snowshoe, uh, cross-country ski, everything like that, uh, flourish during this time. And uh, we want to build on that. We want to build clusters around tourism and uh, really build on the funding that we're seeing become available at our regional level and provincial level. So I just want to say thank you for 
uh, inviting me to the call and uh, share what we're what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to hearing what to everyone else around the room is uh, working on as well. There. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Will. Um, I want to highlight. I, I I love hearing this idea of uh, taking stock and looking at assets. The one thing that I learned a long time ago especially people that live in their own community, sometimes you don't realize the assets you have or you it's you have blinders on because you see them every day. So I think the idea of taking stock, doing an inventory, and then packaging, repackaging, promoting, creating awareness, these kinds of things that we're hearing about, that's exactly the, the kind of thing uh, that's required. It's It's I call it like it's product development and market readiness. And, and that's how you grow your market. That's how you grow demand for your market is by getting uh, product out into the market and becoming market ready and then sharing that with your target market. So I, I, I love what I'm hearing both on the West Coast and uh, right down the highway in, in Durham. Thank you for sharing everybody. Thank you, Dan, for adding that as well. Uh, I wanted to throw out a, a fresh question to the stage and to the audience listening. You know, there's a, there's sort of this a lot of talk around uh, what does tourism look like moving forward in terms of remoteness, uh, virtualness, et cetera. So what I'd love to know is this. I know that in the work that Dan and I have done with entrepreneurs, we're constantly trying to cultivate local entrepreneurs to innovate. Um, I'm wondering if anyone would love to share their thoughts or ideas around how do we start asking our local communities to participate in the idea of tourism, perhaps come up with some um, ideas that uh, people have never thought about. Perhaps I, I just read this recent blog on a new app in the US, I believe, that encourages farmers to allow some of their farmland to be used for campsites. So, you know, and I'm sure that the economic developer and us can start thinking about, well, wow, there's marketing that's great, but there's probably a lot of challenges there. But, you know, that's that's one way of really looking to our local market to say, hey, we would love to reinvigorate tourism in our community. Who has ideas? Is anyone sort of participating in this opportunity of asking, asking our local members? Brandon, would you like to? Ask? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. And, and we've got a new cidery business in, in Uxbridge, Slabtown Cider. And they actually mentioned this type of program, I think last fall or last summer at some point that they're joining a network of on-farm accommodations where people can go and set up and they'll have a number of uh, campsites that are available and, and facilities, but yeah, building out the um, kind of these short-term accommodation opportunities on the site of the farm. We've had some, a, a growing number of golf courses at accommodations or small cabins to um, their site. So we're definitely seeing an uptick in, in that type of growth in, in Durham region. Wonderful. Did anyone else want to add to that conversation or do we have any questions from the audience? I'm wondering, uh, Lara was talking a little bit about innovation. I don't know if she's got other examples or experiences she's seen out of the U.S. or otherwise, but would love to hear what she's got to say. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, you know, I think there's been a number of examples of ways that organizations have innovated, especially those in the tourism industry. Um, you know, I think about the Downtown Richmond Association. Um, they have a large cultural event that takes place um, every year. And while they had to clearly not have it in person, um, they were able to take portions of it and put them online. Um, in downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, a group put together a concert on the top floor of a parking garage um, so that it was regulated where people had to pay to get into the parking garage, but then they could be part of the concert in their car. Um, one other cool thing that I heard from Milwaukee was they painted hearts six feet apart in a park and brought food trucks in. So you could sit among people in your little heart um, six feet away from other groups of people and utilize the food trucks um, in the community. And, you know, I think that there are other fantastic examples of, you know, art galleries doing tours of their galleries online. Um, but one thing that I've been really impressed with, and this goes 
to tie back to what Bob was saying um, that I've been really impressed with is how much arts organizations have done outreach to their artisan communities to ask them questions about how to best support them. Um, and I think that from that has come some of this great innovation. You know, one example is a busker fest um, where, again, keeping people socially distanced apart um, along a st- uh, kind of a, I hate to use the word alley because it has a negative connotation, but this is a really decorative alley in Salt Lake City. Um, buskers set up, again, keeping socially distanced apart. And people could walk along and hear the different performances from various bus- from various buskers. So, you know, I think that we've become very creative in the way that we are approaching um, getting our arts and culture into the hands of our local residents. I love that parking structure, Carrie, that parking structure. Carrie, did you want to add to it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that we've done at the gallery. Um, the only thing we do was, was offer virtual exhibition walkthroughs with our, with our curator. National Film Festival um, late last year to produce their, to actually do a media event, which was um, done in association with Durham College. And it went really, really well. And it was all done, you know, virtually and, and it worked out well. As a matter of fact, I have a meeting with them this afternoon to talk about other options, whether it be a drive-in sort of scenario. But the beautiful and I guess the gift out of this whole pandemic for us has been the fact that we've always had in our strategic plan for since I've been with the gallery for five years to go beyond the gallery walls and find ways that we can take the amazing programming, whether it be exhibitions or or art classes and and take them virtually. And for us, this actually forced us into that into that field um, because we were doing it naturally. We were we were trying to measure our results on the number of people that came into the gallery. And now we're measuring our results um, through impressions and through how we're able to touch people and how we're able to tell our story. So it's been a real gift in that sense. As much as we've you know, had different challenges, I think Dan pointed out earlier how much funding is available. And it's so exciting when you think that there's no, more funding becoming available for musicians. There's more funding and opportunities announced today around um, around supporting events. And so I think, um, and it's wonderful that um, that you're you're hosting this call. I know for us, it, it inspired us to have a local conversation who's on this call, Create, Creative Durham Region, which is another clubhouse that we're hosting, uh, Rebecca and Jackie Sarah and myself tomorrow. Um, at noon. So of course, you're all welcome to join where we're talking about how we can support artists and musicians through this time. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So thank you for allowing me to weigh in on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carrie. The other thing I want to highlight, and, and uh, I'm sure many people on this call, I, I just Carrie King, and I have an affinity to the to the word and the concept of creative. So I mean, you know, the you never want to waste uh, a, a crisis. So I think this crisis is forcing people to get more creative, more innovative. And I'm hoping what comes out of it is uh, in this new normal that we're going to enter at some point in time, the, like the new, new normal, that some form of stability is, uh, of course, we're going to lean back on some of our old ways. And that's probably not a bad thing. Um, funding will go away at some point in time or it'll diminish um, and we're going to have to reinvent our businesses. So I just, I'm delighted to hear about innovative thinking, uh, the golf courses and the farmers on STA, you know, virtual going beyond our walls, these alleyways. And I, I, I invite anybody else who, who's got any, um, who's, who's not up yet, who wants to speak or who's on our panel speaking on sharing any other creative and innovative you know, observations they've had or, or other ideas they've had. That's really the only way we're going to, um, I think, prosper and grow moving forward. So I just want to give kudos to 
our innovators and our creative thinkers. Dan, I'm so glad you brought that up. I know one of the first programs I taught years ago was this program called Artrepreneur, which is, you know, how are we helping artisans understand uh, how to build sort of a monetized business model? Because, you know, my experience with those in the artisan community is they do what they do because they love what they do. And when you try to, you know, sort of attach this price tag or this this exchange of cash, it, it can sometimes feel a little bit under uncomfortable or sullied. So I think that I'm wondering if that leads us to our next question. And, and maybe we've answered it a little bit in the previous question, which is, you know, how are we addressing that skills gap, that understanding that these these folks that we know that are creative and amazing at what they do, you know, how are we helping them build that? business model around what it is that they want to do so more than just creating an amazing experience and reinvigorating tourism in our community how do we make sure that that's a sustainable model i'm curious to know if anyone has experience with bill would you like to add to that conversation yeah thanks bob i'll, I'll just share a recent example that we had i think it comes down to looking at all age groups, what we um, recently have uh, focused in on is the youth in our community. So making sure that they're aware of entrepreneur opportunities. Uh, we have, uh, it's, it's very interesting and I wrote down the, uh, the art entrepreneur, maybe you can send me something afterwards about that because I'm very curious about it. Uh, but we had uh, some grant funding that we received to put into the hands of youth in our community to start their own businesses. And uh, in the last two years, you know, I, I said previously we're a community of about 7,000 people. We've had 200 youth go through the program in the last two years to learn about entrepreneurship. So whether they're making products for the farmer's market, whether they're making products for our Christmas uh, craft fairs that we have, or, you know, just doing uh, lawn maintenance businesses in the summer, I think it's very important to introduce our youth at a very young age to go into the schools, uh, to provide that uh, education, work with our partners, and uh, show them uh, that, you know, entrepreneurship is an option. Wonderful. Thank you, Will. Laura, did you want to add a conversation? I, I do. Um, so in 2016, Mary Biskupski was elected to office in Salt Lake City, and she had a vision for shaking up the way the city had traditionally conducted economic development. And under the Department of Economic Development she created, she put three divisions. So traditional business development, you know, recruit, retain, expand, help businesses get started, then she put the Arts Council, which was a separate legal entity, who the staff were city staff employees. Um, and she put the Redevelopment Agency. And when you sort of think about arts as part of economic development, it, it seems strange as a traditional pure economic development person. Um, when she asked me to lead this new department, um, I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm going to oversee an Arts Council. I've never done that. have no experience, but let's go and what ended up happening was just this amazing um synergy between the business development team that was helping businesses get started working with the arts council to educate future artists to become entrepreneurs um and then the redevelopment agency really helping to fund the city's public art collection that was curated by the arts council and so what you ended up seeing was just this amazing um, synergy. And it was really fun to watch our staff begin to think about how do we include arts and culture in everything that we're doing as part of our economic development work. And I I'm going to um, give them a lot of kudos. Felicia, Felicia Baca leads the Salt Lake City Arts Council, and she's done a couple of amazing things during this pandemic. The first thing she did is she created an artist career empowerment grant program to encourage more artists to become career artisans. Um, but then she also created a racial equity and inclusion grant to look at ways that we can enhance the racial equity and inclusion um, for artists throughout the city of Salt Lake. So, um, you know, I just I think it was just a really interesting model for the way that we traditionally do economic development. Hey. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. Jimmy, thank you for Jimmy. Am I saying it right? Jimmy, thank you for joining us on stage. Yes. Uh, I just want to make sure you knew that your your mic was on. Um, but other than that, so Laura, yes, that's so that's an interesting concept where you you sort of created this this bridge between in what my, in my experience are three sort of entities, right? As you had said, so you've got the 
the, the business generation, you've got the arts, culture, and heritage, and, and then you've got this sort of this third aspect. So I think that's beautiful. And I wonder if other communities have, have looked at that. I know that, in, Dan, have you seen, I know, I think, Dan, we've seen that in Simcoe County in some parts. Yeah, Bob, and, and before Jimmy goes on, I just want to, so interesting enough, uh, when I started my career in economic development, it was a rural area and uh, arts and culture was very much part of a sector. And I want to share a quick story. Uh, long story short, we did a taste trail that was highly successful with restaurants, wineries, breweries, etc. And the arts community uh, saw that and they were jealous, envious, and interested, maybe more importantly. Long story short, I put a group together that included uh, government-run museums, government arts, and, and the local artists. So at the end of the day, artists are usually uh, um, they're entrepreneurs. They are sole proprietors. They are small businesses. And so they're very much uh, part of the economy, especially in small rural areas. Uh, we held several meetings and our, our local government folks were, were dragging on a decision to create an arts trail. Long story short, I found myself negotiating what I call a coup, really a coup d'etat by the artist saying, uh, government, if you don't hurry up, we're just going to kick you out and we're going to take over. So I did my best to negotiate with the government folks. They couldn't get it together. And we ended up launching an arts trail owned by, run by, motivated by the arts community. So they took the bull by the horns. They said, we can't wait anymore. This is too important. And we're going to go ahead and and do it. So that's one of my favorite stories because I've never been... Um, in the middle of a coup d'etat between artists and government. Uh, fortunately, the, there was no guns drawn and no knives thrown, and it was a, a peaceful uh, overthrow. But that's definitely the next Leonardo DiCaprio movie, Dan. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, I think I think in some cases, and maybe Laura's experience, Laura's experiences as well, is sometimes you you do sort of have to take the initiative and ask for uh, forgiveness later. I just want to reset the room uh, really quick because I know we've had some new folks join us. Uh, just to remind folks that we're here today talking about tourism as it relates to economic development. I want to thank all of you. Uh, Dan and I both want to thank all of you for being here and contributing your time and your thoughts. <clears throat> the way the room works is if you're in the audience and you have a question or you'd like to share on stage, there's a little icon on the bottom that has a hand over a notepad. If you press that, that's a raised hand option. Mm -hmm. Dan and I can bring you up on stage. The room today is being recorded. We are going to share this on a podcast in the future. So do please be aware of that. And if you're hearing some amazing things here and you want to share it with your friends, or you want your uh, associates or colleagues to be involved, the plus sign on the bottom will allow you to invite those in your network to come in and join us in on this conversation. We've still got another 18 minutes remaining on it. So we'd love to hear from them as well. And again, as I keep saying, we have some amazing knowledge leaders on stage when it comes to economic development. If you haven't yet, be sure to follow everyone you see on that stage. Be sure that you connect with them and, and, and be aware of what other rooms are going to be in because there's some great knowledge being dispensed here. And finally, one thing I've forgotten in the last updates, Dan, which I apologize for, is if you hear something you really enjoy and you really like, if you uh, hit your mute button on and off, on and off, that represents clapping in a clubhouse room. So, if, yes, perfect. So if that's something that you really resonate with, please feel free to show that to show love to the speaker as well. Um, we just had Jimmy join us on stage. And Jimmy, I, I don't have a particular question to pose, but perhaps I can ask you a little bit more about your experience in economic development as it crosses over with tourism, perhaps? Um, sure. I have been an economic developer in rural Texas for about 17 years now. So in a small town, you kind of do it all. You know, you do economic development and that isn't just uh, traditional economic development. It's a little bit of everything. So being involved in the tourism aspect, um, it, it still crosses over into my area as well. Uh, we do have chamber, a chamber of commerce. And so they do kind of the heavy lifting on that side. Um, but in our region of Texas, we belong to some regional organizations like the Texas Midwest Community Network, the Texas Forks Trails, and I'm, I'm very actively involved with those groups and we kind of promote the whole region um, for tourism. Thank you, Jimmy. I love the idea of ecosystem partnerships. I think that's one thing in my term as an economic development officer, and I know Dan has got experience in that, is how are we building 
those ecosystems and partnerships. Durham is representing well in that respect here in this. Really awesome. Uh, Jimmy, I don't know if you know your mic is still on, but, just wanted, but James, do you want to contribute as well? Yeah, well, speaking of ecosystems, so, I mean, the wonderful thing about tourism, and then we've been drilling down into arts and culture, you know, you could argue in any community there is a mega uh, ecosystem and sub-ecosystems, and then there's these regional or cross regional. The good thing about economic development and business and people is people don't necessarily recognize borders like governments do. And so um, there's a great opportunity for our communities to not only develop, we talked about uh, um, product development, market readiness and awareness. And then this idea, you know, Durham region would probably be a good example of, you know, cross border slash cross regional promotion. So uh, I, I've had a lot of experience working with different communities. And what I find is people want to collaborate and want to cooperate. And, and there's not really a need to, to compete in most cases. And I think that's one of the most wonderful things about economic development and about tourism. And I don't know if anyone else has some experience they want to share about, you know, going beyond their their borders, however they might even define those borders, but would love to hear other stories if there are any. Well, I can jump in here if you like. Um, so one example, and it was a, it was an um, initiative that I was um, fortunate enough to be involved with from the beginning was Culture Days and being a national initiative. Um, I think it was great just to see um, our country investing in culture in that way. And I think it helped um, a lot of smaller communities kind of step up and realize that their cultural offerings um, mattered. And it's not just, you know, the big tourism attractions in big cities like Toronto that were valuable and that these wonderful rural attractions and the agritourism opportunities and the craft brewery tours and all that could be tied into an initiative like Culture Days where people, so it gets people moving around uh, an area. Uh, although, I mean, there were some, some challenges in just saturation of, you know, too many things for people to do, but it was nice to see the country um, offering an initiative like that. And I think it, it does help um, ultimately develop uh, the tourism product and the cultural product that we that we have in every area, just because it, it helps us to start mapping it and tracking it and 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 seeing those tourism attractions as uh, a vital part of developing an economy and a creative economy at that. Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate that insight as well. Pleasure. Has anyone else sort of experienced that? As Dan had asked, that sort of cross-regional, cross-pollination of, of partnering with events. I, I think, um, Will, would you like to add to that conversation as well? Yeah, I'm not sure if this is a common theme from our uh, colleagues uh, on the call here, but I'm seeing there's a lot more uh, regional collaborations. Uh, our provincial uh, tourism organization is Destination BC, and we have a lot more regional trails uh, that are that are forming. So road trips, circle tours, everything like that, and they're forming around particular themes. So uh, some, for example, are around the uh, BC Farmers Market Association, where they're bringing in our smaller rural communities and making sure that they're uh, you know sitting at the table and they're well represented. BC Farmers Market Association, BC Ale Trail, uh, there's culinary uh, associations that are forming up. So I'd be curious to hear if that's a common theme. I'm noticing it uh, within the last uh, you know, couple of years here that uh, additional funding has been allocated for these regional uh, trails and uh, provincial associations that are focused around circle tours and supporting our rural communities to have a seat at the table where historically we haven't his uh, been there. Wonderful question, Will. Uh, Rebecca, you've just joined us on stage. Did you want to jump in on that question and give thoughts to share? Yeah, thanks for letting me jump in here. I just wanted to add something that I thought was kind of interesting and it got me thinking about um, the new direction that the Project for Public Spaces recently um, announced. For anyone who doesn't follow them, um, I would highly encourage, I wish there was a way we could share resources on this platform in Clubhouse, but Project for Public Spaces or PPS.org is an amazing website. They have unreal like resources and case studies 
um, from all over the world, but they recently announced a new direction that they're taking in terms of partnering and I guess collaborating more with um, corporations in terms of corporate social responsibility. And so that's another thing that I've often thought about, you know, coming from municipal, the municipal environment, um, and now kind of back into this, the private sector, you know, collaboration is a big part of like what, what we do in, in the private sector and in the role I'm in now. But um, in government, you know, I found there was a bit of a gap in terms of being able to have someone that was directly working with people within our um, within our corporate you know, environment, let's say, um, and aligning initiatives that um, were in the realm of the municipal and public sphere and, and aligning those with any sort of goals or corporate social responsibility goals, maybe that um, businesses within the area we're also looking to align with um, because, you know, when, when money is a factor, I guess you look to where, where is the money? And so I guess being able to uh, more cohesively have those two paths crossing more frequently, I think would be super beneficial to, you know, goals for the public and having, you know, our corporate world being able to align with those. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I, um, I'm going to suggest uh, there uh, for those that aren't connected to me on LinkedIn, send me a note. Uh, we d I did do an invite on LinkedIn, and I think that's a place where we could collect resources on this topic. So, uh, you know, after the call, send me a note and I'll make sure that those resources get put up on the event page uh, for here. The other thing, that, you know, it's really interesting. When I first started in economic development, I came from both the uh, a corporate and an entrepreneurial a background and and the biggest thing i learned in my entrepreneurial background right was leveraging resources and partnerships and collaboration so i don't know if that's a private sector thing and i don't know i i, I think governments are pretty good at collaborating these days but i know when i first started it was a, a bit unusual so I'm a huge proponent of leverage, right? And one of the best ways to leverage is to work with other people and to leverage each other's strengths and to collaborate. Uh, in fact, one of the things I used to do, uh, well, I still do it now, is I call it trial balloons. I'm never really afraid of competition uh, because I think ideas are only worth 10% and execution is worth 90%. So I often trial balloon things to get feedback and I usually feel that if I'm doing that, A, I'm looking for collaboration and input, and B, I guess if people are gonna steal your ideas, so be it, but you know, it takes a lot of effort to actually execute things. So I, I uh, part of my collaboration is to give sneak peeks, let people know what I'm up to. Uh, often I'll find collaborators, and very rarely, if ever, have I found that people kind of you know, one up me on, on 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 an idea I might have. Really great thoughts, Dan. Thank you for that. I also want to jump back to to Will's point as well. Sort of this idea around, um, for lack of a better word, ecosystem meeting. So, Will, I wanted to to share some insight into what I've done in my past. Now, believe me, this is many of my tools from my Robin Duplicate era. But there was a, I think they're still around. There's an agency. Uh, in York region that covers Simcoe County called Venture Lab. And Venture Lab really articulated this idea of having ecosystem meetings where the goal was you essentially, it's exactly everything you said, Will, you essentially invite all of these shareholders, but, you know, uh, contributors, thought makers, anyone that you can bring around the table. Venture Lab used to have, it was so large, we used to have to steal table, uh, sorry, chairs from like the next office over. So it was such a really well attended meeting that as I moved into different economic development roles, I was always an advocate for this. So I can tell you we've done it in the past. And when we've done it, it wasn't specific. It wasn't industrially specific, meaning that it would have tourism and culture involved, economic development, business development. We'd even try and plan, sorry, invite planners and obviously by law. The goal was how do we create sort of this harmonious communication as it relates to a specific goal, which is for all of us, the betterment of our communities. That, I, I, that's my humble definition of economic development. We all do it for the betterment of our communities. So I wanted to give you that, Will. And if you wanted to know more information, that's sort of tied to the same group that came up with Entrepreneur. So I might want to connect you with that organization. They, they've obviously got some great ideas. Now, they have new leadership, but the leadership they had had some really, really great ideas. 
that might help in a community like yours. Uh, and I will say that it was a really great way of engaging our rural centers. So in communities I've worked with, they've generally been fairly decent sized cities. So the, the question becomes, how do we engage hamlets and towns? Ecosystem meetings were a great opportunity to do that. So I just wanted to add that to make sure that we add it to Will's point. And yes, thank you, Rebecca and Dan, for, for adding that to the conversation as well. So we are in our last six minutes here. I wanted to make sure that uh, we I reach out to everyone to see if they had any final thoughts on, you know, everything you've heard today. You know, the goal really is understanding where is tourism going to be? Uh, what are some things that we can look at? And Dan, can I start with you? I'd love for you to sort of help us sum everything up. Sure. And a couple of things, if we could maybe wrap up a minute or so ahead of time, or at least I'm going to wrap the recording up a minute or so. And if people want to stick around, that'd be great. I have a hard stop at one. So, you know, so first of all, I'm a, I'm an eternal optimist. And while, you know, it's really interesting. We always think we, um, we have guarantees in life and there's no guarantees. We don't know what the future is going to be like. Uh, I believe the future will uh, reinvent itself. There's a, there's an old um, economist called uh, Joseph Schrumpter that talks about creative destruction. I believe we're in the midst of creative destruction right now. And out of that comes reinvention. So I'm bullish that we are going to create uh, new realities and new worlds in tourism. Uh, at some point in time, we're all going to be shoulder to shoulder again and, and probably better off than ever. And I think in the meantime, we're going to figure out what does a... What does a distanced, creative, virtual, hybrid solution look like? So I uh, would love to hear any final thoughts on that. But I, I believe that um, we're going to get through these hard times. Uh, we're going to recover. We're going to be uh, better off than ever before and, and have new tools in our toolbox to do new tricks. Thank you, Dan. Did anyone else want to contribute uh, to some final thoughts from Brandon? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for having me up on stage. I'll close the loop. The van's running and we're driving it to its uh, scheduled maintenance. So that's a good win for us. But yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation today and with some colleagues from the Durham region and getting to hear some perspectives from BC and Texas is, is really cool and looking forward to keeping this conversation going. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, Rebecca, did you want to contribute or did someone else want to contribute any final thought? Don. <laughs> Yeah, I could just jump in to say I, uh, part of the discussion that I love the most today was thinking about and encouraging um, reaching across, whether it be municipal borders, but also from arts and culture to sport as well, or breaking down those silos. We recently hosted quite successfully the Ontario Parasport Games. And with that gave us a wonderful opportunity to not only promote uh, accessibility and inclusion, but also bring the arts community to the forefront of those games as well. So um, let's not lose those opportunities also. Wonderful. Thank you, Don, for contributing as well. Thank you all for jumping on the stage and sharing your thoughts. I know it can, uh, it's a new platform, so it's very appreciative. Carrie, did you want to add as well a final thought? Carrie, Carrie King, sorry. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you. You guys have really inspired me. And we're excited to host our own sort of Durham Region creative um, session uh, tomorrow and our second one. And so thank you very much for connecting all of us. I really, really appreciate it. And it's a great way to, it, to spend a lunch hour. So thanks so much. And uh, great to connect with all of you. Our absolute pleasure, for sure. Okay, so with that, you know what? I know that we've got a hard stop at one. So with that, maybe we'll end it here. I want to thank you all for being here. And Dan, did you want to add one final thought? Maybe? Yeah, just as part of our, our wrap up. And thank you. Really appreciate everybody showing up, uh, adding some great value. Um, this is a, a standing session that we have every Wednesday, noon Eastern Standard Time. Our next uh, session is the 24th of March, and we are focused on, inspired by and, and um, about requested by Carrie King on the creative economy. So that'll be our next chat. And the one after that, 
uh, Lara had brought up, and that's going to be on rural economic development. So some great stuff coming up. I'm going to stop the recording now, but the conversation can continue a little bit. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. And podcast is coming shortly.